thousands of human beings and of angels but don't have love. I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I have nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. Oh, I get that one wrong a lot. It doesn't keep a record. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecy, they'll be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child, but now that I've become a man, I've put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I've been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain these three things, and the greatest of these is love. 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 And Jesus says to his disciples as they gathered us, they're listening to him after he spoke, spoke in a series of beatitudes. But I say to you who are willing to hear, that's the hard part about the gospel, amen? It's the willingness to hear Jesus that sets us in the path of being disciples. We have to be willing to hear him. And what follows, as Ken says, it is really a manual for how we are to conduct ourselves in the world, how we are to be the people of God. And brothers and sisters, I met with some clergy friends of mine this week because we come around the table every other month to talk about issues that are happening, happening in our communities, like poverty and drug abuse. But most importantly, we talk about racism and one of my colleagues said, you know, I was preaching this passage in Luke one day, and a member of my church came up to me and blasted me. He said, how could you say things like that? And if you ever say those words again, I'm never coming back to church. She said, I was just reading the scripture. <laughs> it's Jesus who says, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Back in the mid-60s, there was a, a young teenager who had left home with a friend and had traveled a long way. And he was a white man, and he found himself in the deep south, penniless, not money for food, nothing that he really needed to continue on his journey. And he and his friend found a little country church. And they walked into the basement of that church where a gathering of African Americans was taking place. And he said it seemed like they were terrified to see us at the door. And if you think about it, in the mid-60s in the South, if you have two strange men who come into the midst of your meeting, you don't know where they're from or what they want, surely you fear for your life a little bit, amen? And he told the story that as he entered into that place and saw those eyes looking back at him, they said, please, we're traveling. We're not from here. We have no family. We have no resources. Can you help us? And those sharecroppers.
neighbors. One of them took a hat off of his head and they began to pass it around the table. And they collected a small offering and gave it to the young man and his companion so that they, even though they were here illegally, they could have some food to eat. The young man went back because the police told him, you've got to go back to your home country. Come back again another time. So the young man went back. And a few years later, he came back legally to the U.S. and found a woman, and that man was my father. So when I grew up, I understood the realities of the blessings that we have here in this country but also the reality that we, in that blessedness, must never forget that we have among us, in our own communities, but outside of our borders around the world, brothers and sisters who need to know God's love. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And if someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other one as well. I was always uncomfortable with these words. Because I'm a fighter. I always wanted to say, why? Why on earth would you offer the other cheek? Just punch them. Take them down. <laughs> Show them who's boss. My father, whose birthday is today, though this is the first one he celebrates in heaven, my father went into public service. And that is an ugly business to be in at any level. Because I could open up the newspaper on any given day and see headlines saying, what a jerk my dad was. <laughs> headlines saying horrible things that I knew to not be true. You live a very public life that way. But what I understood was what the newspapers showed and what happened in our living room were often very different things. Because I grew up in a household where from any, any given day, somebody might knock on the door and they would say, I need your help. I need you to help me put gas in my car. I need you to talk to the city and have my water cut back on. I need you to help me get my child out of jail and into rehab. I need you. And this was often a great burden. And when my father would travel for business, they would still come and my mom would say, I should be the one who's the mayor because I'm doing all of this stuff. <laughs> sit there and say, why are you going to help that jerk? You just said something horrible, horrible about him in public. Why do you want to help them? You know, you know that they're crooks. You know they're ripping you off. Why would you help this person? They're taking from people who need it more. Why? But then there's this gospel that we come back to about lending with the expectation of nothing in return. Lending. Knowing that there's going to be a great reward someday. You'll be acting in the way children of the Most High act, for He is kind to ungrateful and wicked people. Be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Jesus calls us to live this life. It's not an easy life, and especially in today's world, we have so much to draw lines and be divided about in our world, in our communities, in our country. We have so much to look at that says, I'm not like you and you're not like me. We're going to go separate ways. But Jesus calls us to transcend all of those arguments, to not be people who give with any expectation of being rewarded here in this life, but instead being those who love in spite of who is in front of us, even our enemies. It's a call that many of us will find challenging, 
And so as we're thinking about how it is we do these 10,000 hours of service in the larger community, I want to ask you, as you perform those acts, was there love in your heart? As you drove your friend who needed a ride, as you helped out that troop, as you coached, was there love in your heart? Because as Paul told us, we can do all sorts of things. We can say the right words. We can do the right actions. But we have to have within our hearts the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ as we do that. Otherwise, we're nothing. Noisy gongs, climbing symbols. I think about all of the lessons I've learned in my lifetime thus far. And this whole idea of loving is the hardest one. Amen? But it is the very core of our gospel. It is the very root of what we do and what we believe. That there was a God who took on flesh and blood and came to live and dwell among us and teach us, who called us to live in this way, and then in the ultimate act of sacrifice died for our sins, we who were even his enemies, that we could experience eternal life, resurrection, and hope. We are God's people, not because we were God's allies. Not because our citizenship was in the right place with our Lord. Not because of anything we deserved as people. But because God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but may have eternal life. Don't judge, Jesus says, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good portion, packed down, firmly shaken, and overflowing, will fall into your lap. The portion you give will determine the portion you receive in return. Brothers and sisters, I'm putting you on notice. I'm going to call on you to love. I'm going to be policing you in social media. As your pastor, I'm going to be listening in to the conversations you have with others, the words you say to others. And if I hear you speak in a tongue that is not of love, I'm going to call you out on it. <clears throat> I expect you to do the same for me. If you hear me say something that is not love, correct me in love. I pray that we can all do that for one another. <clears throat> because the time is here. The time that we are called to to model what Jesus spoke, not just in the actions that we have performed in our community and will continue to do as we move forward, but in all of our conduct, to be Jesus' ambassadors and representatives, a citizenship that is in heaven. May God give us the grace to speak this truth and may we receive this word in God's time. Thanks be to our Lord. Thanks be to God for his grace. And may all that we do bring about the kingdom of Jesus as we love one another.